But wow, we have finally made it to case seven of the brain imaging course. I'm Brent Weinberg from LearnerRadiology.com. We're going to go through this last case. It's going to be an exciting one. And we're going to finish up the course. At the end, we're going to have a little recap. If uh, you haven't seen uh, some of the stuff, then go back and uh, take a look at it. Uh, we're happy to, uh, to learn a little bit more from that. If you're following along on the interactive cases, here's the interactive course website, LearnerRadiology.com, Brain Capstone. We'll put a link down below in the video description if you need to check it out. So let's go ahead and get started. K7 is a 37 year old man presenting with the worst headache of his life. If you've taken step one or any of the USMLEs, you might recognize this history. All right, so here we have some images from our case here. In the top left, we have a non-contrast head CT, the axial images. Top right, we have some coronal images from that same non-contrast head CT. The bottom left, we have a CTA, or a CT angiogram. That's gonna help us figure out what's going on here. And here we have some coronal images from a CT angiogram. But let's start with the non-contrast head CT, the axial images. I'll do what I always do. I'll go to the bottom here. We'll start from the bottom, kind of scroll up. We start to see problems right away. You should see CSF here. It looks like you've got some hyperdense material. That's blood. And so that's in the subarachnoid space, so that's subarachnoid hemorrhage. See some blood in the fourth ventricle here. That's definitely a problem. And as you come up to the basal cisterns, you see blood wrapping around the midbrain, blood filling the basal cisterns here wrapping out into the cilium fissures so blood everywhere kind of wrapping around the entirety of the midbrain definitely a problem here uh, you see it seems to be centered around the basal cistern so that's going to be important we see a little bit too much temporal horn here so that we've got some hydrocephalus as well definitely a problem definitely some blood coming up at the foramen of monroe still in cilium fissures interhemispheric fissure so that's uh, a lot of subarachnoid blood so it's pretty bad subarachnoid hemorrhage if you take a look at the coronal images, you just confirm the same thing. Anteriorly, a lot of blood along the falx, a lot of blood in the basal cisterns. You see the bilateral sylvian fissures here. So when you see a subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, the most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is trauma. If the person doesn't have a significant history of trauma, though, the most uh, common cause is an aneurysm. And so we're going to be looking for, for an aneurysm in this case. Now to look for an aneurysm, we need to do some sort of vascular imaging. For that, we have a CT angiogram. Uh, for that, we don't really need a CT angiogram of the neck, but we do want to, uh, to have the head. So we need to include the entirety of the head. I pick one vessel, usually the right internal carotid, and I follow it up. I'm going to follow it through the Petrus Canal here. We're going to see the cavernous portion of the ICA here. It's going to bifurcate into the MCA. We've got an ACA comes up through the ACAs there. So far, so good. I'm not really seeing anything in that right carotid, or that right anterior system. So I usually come back and we're going to take a look at this left internal carotid. Comes up again through the Petrus Canal, cavernous portion, ophthalmic, terminal carotid. We see a PCOM here. Looks okay so far. Again, Got my ACA, uh-oh. On this ACA, I see a little bit of a blip here. There's something sticking out medially from that A1, A2 junction there. I'm a little worried that that's, uh, that's, a, that's an aneurysm. We're gonna take another look at that later, but we don't wanna fall victim to satisfaction of search. So we wanna make sure we come back. We're gonna check our vertebral arteries, which are here. We're gonna take a look at them. See the basilar artery here. Looks okay, it's kind of traversing some blood, but it looks otherwise okay. SCAs, PCAs here, PCAs wrap around. So we're looking all okay, except for right here at the ACOM. That's a very common location for aneurysm. It's right in the middle of all this blood. So I'm a little bit worried. We're gonna take another look at that on our coronal images. Let's see what we can see here. And uh, so these are coronal MIPS. And what we see here is we've got our carotids. They come up, we have our ACAs here, ACA number one. ACA number two on the right here, and we've got this rightward directed out pouching coming right off the A1, A2 junction there, right at the ACOM. This is an ACOM aneurysm, which is likely to be the source of our bleeding. So let's take a look at some summary slides here. We've got the non-contrast head CT. Again, blood in the cilium fissures, basal cisterns kind of everywhere, a little bit of hydrocephalus, more blood as you go up a little bit higher. It's really centered in an anterior location, right? So a lot of blood anteriorly, cilium fissures, interhemispheric fissure. So that's where we want to look for our aneurysm. And so what is the cause of this hemorrhage? If you're looking at this question, we already know 
the most common cause in, outside of trauma is a ruptured aneurysm, which we found there at the anterior communicating region. So this is a ruptured aneurysm. Uh, here you just see some arrows on that finding that we found along the anterior communicating artery there, about four millimeters if you put some measurements on it. Here you see it again in the coronal view. Here in a sagittal view, you see, see the same thing. This is a four millimeter aneurysm. Now, if you do an angiogram, you can see the same thing. You've got your carotid here, your A1 segment, and this uh, laterally directed out pouching off of the uh, off of the ACOM there. You can do 3D reformats from a spin from an angiogram. You can make some measurements there to plan your treatment. Here's some images from the treatment. Uh, they've done some endovascular therapy here, place some coils in that. You can see on this uh, contrast run, there's not very much filling of that aneurysm anymore. And so this is after coil embolization. Question 7b, what's a well-known complication of subarachnoid hemorrhage and when does it occur? So one of the most common subarachnoid hemorrhage complications is vasospasm. That's essentially a reaction of the vessels of the brain where they narrow inappropriately. You can have complications such as stroke and ischemia, and so that uh, can be a problem. It usually occurs in a little bit of a delay after the hemorrhage, really, you know, starts around four or five days, goes maybe 10 to, to 15, 18 days. And so that's really the peak is around four to 10 days. So it happens in a delayed fashion after subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage from aneurysm rupture has a lot of risk factors, hypertension, blood uh, drug use, uh, alcohol use, a lot of connective tissue disorders like Marfan syndrome, et cetera, and uh, then other risk factors for having an aneurysm, okay, having a family history, connective tissue disorder, so we, we already saw there. Um, if you have aortic coarctation or bicuspid aortic valve, those are associated. Uh, the patterns of subarachnoid hemorrhage that we see, supracellular cistern and diffuse, this is really the supracellular cistern that we're seeing here, kind of diffuse. If it's in front of the brainstem, that's perimesencephalic, that's more likely to be a posterior aneurysm. And if it's over the cerebral convexities, that's kind of more distal, more likely probably to be trauma. Here you see some of the structures labeled here. You see the blood out in the sylvian cistern here. You've got the supracellular cistern, the crural uh, cistern here, interpeduncular between the peduncles here, ambient cistern coming around to the quadrigeminal plate. So just remember that anatomy in those areas can fill up with blood. Now, aneurysms have certain locations which are more common. The anterior circulation is responsible for about 90% of aneurysms. The ACA and ACOM is one of the most common locations, representing about 30-40% of all aneurysms like we saw here. Uh, the second most common really is the ICA terminus at the PECOM junction, which is very common. Uh, the rest of them usually occur in the MCAs, kind of out M1, M2 junction. Uh, the posterior circulation is responsible for uh, fewer aneurysms, only about 10%, but you do see them at the basilar tip uh, relatively commonly. So when you're reviewing a case for aneurysm, you want to make sure you check all those locations. You also want to make sure you check the area where there's the most blood on the non-contrast CT. Uh, diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, you want to use a CT to find the hemorrhage. Then when you're looking for aneurysms, you want to do a CTA uh, or a MRA to look for it. Uh, when you're imaging aneurysms, if they're thrombosed, they may have a filling defect or they may not uh, They may not fill. You might see calcification along the walls, like atherosclerotic calcification that's expanded out. After aneurysm rupture and subarachnoid hemorrhage, you can get hydrocephalus, you can get vasospasm, uh, you can get neurogenic pulmonary edema. So those are things to consider. Aneurysms that are larger are more likely to rupture. Uh, if they're large or symptomatic, we treat them, again, like coil embolization in this case, or they can be surgically clipped as well. A lot of times we use calcium channel blockers uh, to treat vasospasm, so we want to follow that up, and a lot of our patients stay in the ICU to get followed up for possible vasospasm. All right, so let's recap. We've seen all of the uh, all of the you know, cases here, we've learned different approaches to approaching head imaging. But what did we learn? We learned about the different modalities used in brain imaging, CT as being a screening exam. We learned how to choose these most appropriately. We learned some basics of reviewing cases and we went through seven cases together. We saw some common imaging pathology. We saw strokes, we saw hemorrhages, we saw an abscess, we saw some tumors as part of our case-based review. And that's, uh, that's really important. All right, thanks to everyone for tuning in and checking out these videos as part of our brain capstone. Hopefully you're able to explore those cases on the website, scroll them on your own, and kind of practice uh, how to do neuroradiology on your own. And hopefully this gave you some of the basics to learn about which modalities you might use, 
how you might choose them, and so that you could develop some basic skills uh, on your own that you can take into your practice, whether it's as a radiologist, a neurologist, or, or anyone else involved in healthcare, or even if you're just uh, someone interested in imaging. Hopefully this was an educational opportunity for you. Be sure to check out the rest of the videos on the website. We've got a lot of great content there at learnerradiology.com, the YouTube channel, of course. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe and uh, check out the rest of our videos. Thanks for tuning in today.